Hello. Hello. Hi, everybody. I'm back. Welcome back to my channel. Happy, I think it's Wednesday now. <laughs> Sorry, I missed Tuesday. I just had to, but I'm back now. I have to get back on that horse really quick. Um, otherwise, I'll never get back on it again. I know my brain well enough. Okay, if it's your first time visiting, thank you so much for stopping by. I very much appreciate you um, coming by my little channel. And um, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already to help me hit 500 before my birthday. In case you're wondering why I have an L plate in the background, that's exactly why. I'm a learner streamer and it's not coming off until I reach 500 subs. But I will appreciate all of my new subs lately. It's been awesome. We're getting there much quicker. I thought I was never going to get off my L plates, but now it's looking possible. Hi, everybody. G'day, Kane. Michael Stock. Yeah, you should like this one. Keely, no problems, Keely. You, they need someone to love them. Collecting funnel webs. Are you rescuing funnel webs or are you collecting them to feed to something? Yeah, stay safe, exactly. Good morning, Daz. G'day. Hi, Kaz. Hi, Rob Kent. JP, good morning. I haven't even seen you this morning. Hi, Russ Wake. Hi. Good morning, Nicole Kent. I'm feeling much better. I was actually feeling better yesterday. I was just exhausted. It's like if any of you who have this um, will understand when you get like an anxiety attack or like a bit of a PTSD it wasn't a meltdown, it was an anxiety attack. And it just, you get this hangover from it the next day and it can leave you just exhausted. It, that's what happened to me yesterday. So, but I am fine today. Like I said, I've just got to get straight back into it. Otherwise I can be really flaky and I, <laughs> and I never will. So today we're looking at some of the worst, like, um, medical, <laughs> ideas from history and they seemed like a good idea at the time and they probably worked quite well some of them but then the monsters that they became so we'll get us straight into it and here we are with with number one now number one is cocaine <laughs> um the wonder drug, it was known as, and around the mid 1800s, scientists were able to isolate the active ingredient of the coca leaf, um, erythroxylin coca, I think, which became later known as cocaine. Pharmaceutical companies loved this new fast acting and relatively inexpensive stimulant. In 1884, an Austrian op ophthalmologist, what's that, an eye thing? Um, Carol Collar discovered that a few drops of cocaine solution put on a patient's um, cornea acted as a topical anesthetic, and it made the eye immobile and desensitized to pain and caused less bleeding at the site of the incision, making, the eye, making eye surgery much, much less risky. News of this discovery spread, and soon cocaine was being used in both eyes and sinus surgeries. It was marketed as a treatment for toothaches for children, depression, sinusitis, lethargy, alcoholism, impotence. Cocaine was soon being sold as a tonic, lozenge, powder, and even in cigarettes. You didn't need a prescription to purchase it. Um, you could just go into, sometimes it was even sold in bars and it was famously one of the key ingredients in the soon to be ubiquitous Coca-Cola soft drink that we love so much. By 1902, there were an estimated 200,000 cocaine addicts just in the US. In 1914, the Harrison Narcotic Act outlawed the production, importation and distribution of cocaine. So there you go. That They thought that was a good idea at the time. Imagine just nipping down to the pharmacy to get your kids some cocaine lozenges for a toothache. You know I mean, it's crazy. Okay, number two, heroin was the cure for a cough. <laughs> Finding it to be five times more effective and supposedly less addictive 
than morphine, Bayer began advertising a heroin-laced aspirin in 1898, which they marketed towards children suffering from sore throats, coughs and cold. Some bottles depicted children eagerly reaching for the medicine with their mums giving the sick kids heroin on a spoon. Doctors started to have an inkling that heroin may not be as non-addictive as it seemed when patients began coming back for bottle after bottle. <clears throat> Gosh, I need some heroin for my cough. That was a joke. I don't. Despite the pushback from physicians and negative stories about heroin side effects piling up, Bayer continued to market and produce their product until 1913. Eleven years later, the FDA banned heroin altogether. <laughs> Morning, Kynan. Hi, Lambo. It's nice to see you. Hi, Stephen Webb. Okay, the next one is tobacco. Now, during a 1665 plague outbreak in London, school children were told to smoke cigarettes, which at the time were thought to be disinfectants. In addition, tobacco smoke enemas were a source of common idiom about blowing smoke up people's bum. That's where it came from. Um, they were developed as a sort of 18th century version of CPR by members of the Institute for Affording Immediate Relief to Persons Apparently Dead from Drowning. That's a long name. They would drag the victim out of the River Thames, strip him or her down, and use an enema to literally blow tobacco smoke into the person, either manually or with bellows. Mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation was invented in the 1950s. Back in the late 19th and early 20th century, when the damaging effects of nicotine weren't yet discovered or widely accepted, smoking was used not only for recreational purposes, but also as a medical treatment. It was used for various ailments, including one of the most ridiculous, asthma, which is like the ad behind me is for amazing asthma cigarettes. In 1964, the US Surgeon General report would label cigarettes deadly and urgent urge people to stop smoking. <laughs> Anyone want a tobacco enema? <laughs> I mean, did it ever bring anyone back to life? How did they... <laughs> how did they ever... What, how did they ever think that was going to bring someone back to life? Maybe someone accidentally came back to life just from the shock of it or something or they weren't really dead and then they thought, yep, that works. Okay, now we're going to talk about cannibalism. Ancient Romans clamoured for gladiator blood for strength and vitality, but it was also thought to be a cure for epilepsy. That rationale appeared to be maintained for centuries, based on the Englishman Edward Brown's 1668 um, observation that people attended executions to collect the blood of the victims. In the early 1600s, one German physician's suggested cure for a range of conditions was making a jerky of sorts out of the corpses of 24-year-old redheads. Very specific. Chopping up their bodies and mashing the bits in wine, myrrh and aloe before dry curing them into a jerky. That seems very, very daz. <laughs> You have the same kind of. <laughs> I don't want to know about Thailand. <laughs> there, Lambo. <laughs> but isn't that strangely specific about the 24 year old redheads having to be the cure made into a jerky? I don't understand why it's so specific. Okay, the next one on our list is methamphetamine. Now, methamphetamine was first first synthesized by a Japanese chemist in 1893. Early on, before the adverse effects of the drug were taken into consideration, meth was used to treat a variety of ailments such as narcolepsy, asthma, and was also used as a weight loss drug. I mean, just look at the ads behind me. Now she can cook breakfast again, thanks to meth. You know what I mean? If you want to lose weight, take some meth. You know? 
what the heck like all these housewives on meth that's yeah exactly exactly study no wonder she can cook breakfast again she can't stop cooking breakfast she she's got to do a million things yikes all right the next one i quite like because i'd never heard of it it's called vin mariani and vin mariani tonic was introduced in 1863 and it was advertised both as a wine and as a general cure-all product promising to treat whatever ailment you may have the tonic quickly became a sensation and was widely endorsed and used amongst many famous people hollywood doing it again of the time including pope and thomas edison even the tonic even inspired the invention of coca-cola the reason behind vin mariani's success cocaine the drink contained around six milligrams of cocaine per fluid ounce of wine so there is the precursor to modern day coca-cola vin mariani <laughs> uh, come on i don't think they are now lambo and when they used to be it was because their doctor had prescribed it <laughs> how awful Okay, now we've actually talked about this other one before when we talked about um, some of the worst things women did for beauty in the past, but it's also a medical thing, the tapeworm diet. Now, during Victorian times, people came up with a radical solution to reduce weight, tapeworms. The idea behind it was simple. A person consumes a tapeworm egg so that when the parasite hatches and grows inside the person's intestines, it starts to ingest whatever food the person eats. And this supposedly allows the person to lose weight without decreasing the amount of food that they eat. While today it is known that tapeworms can be dangerous and in some cases even lethal, it, this questionable practice, you may not believe it, is still alive today. So, but I want to know, if you look at this old ad behind me, right, it says eat, eat, eat and always stay thin. But there's like a can of like Caswell's something and it says Caswell's on the label and I want to know what it was because it must have been yum. <laughs> Would you like a, a tin of sanitized tapeworms jar packed? <laughs> this next one, I was really surprised by. I had never heard of it. Malariotherapy. Now, at the beginning of the 20th century, patients suffering from syphilis were treated with malariotherapy. Ailing individuals were deliberately infected with malaria to induce a fever. Apparently, the high fever was enough to kill temperature-sensitive syphilis bacteria, and it's estimated that around 15% of those treated with malariotherapy died from malaria. However, others actually got showed great improvement from their syphilis, um, which is crazy, right? Except malaria, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, you're probably exactly right there, Nicole. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. They should have been doing malaria therapy for weight loss as well. I'm surprised they didn't. Okay, the next one you probably will have heard of. It's pretty famous and it is bloodletting. And it's known as one of the oldest medical practices dating back to 3,000 years to ancient Egypt. The procedure was common in medieval Europe to treat diseases such as smallpox, epilepsy, plague. However, it didn't end there. Bloodletting was commonly practiced throughout the 19th century too and is sometimes even used today. Uh, towards the end of the 19th century, the treatment was discredited when doctors finally admitted that depleting the body's blood supply can be risky and doesn't have many valuable health benefits. Bloodletting puts a patient at risk of having cardiac arrest. Losing too much blood can cause dangerously low blood pressure, in addition to the possibility of infections and anemia. So don't be going doing any bloodletting. <laughs> oh, JP. <laughs> JP, you and Gaz have both had malaria. So I imagine you both, if you did have syphilis, it's gone. <laughs> what an awful thing to say. Don't even say it. 
Okay, the next one, again, we have talked about in our beauty um, is pain sort of video that we did, but it was marketed as a medicine also, arsenic. Now, arsenic is one of the oldest medicines that dates back to ancient times. However, even though the toxic properties of arsenic were known, the chemical was used to treat various diseases up until the 20th century. Arsenic compounds were ingredients in many tinctures, um, balms, tablets, uh, which were used to treat diseases uh, such as sleeping sickness and syphilis. Again, the syphilis. Now, <clears throat> I don't even know what to say about this last one. I wasn't, they did it to feed the redheads. <laughs> Lambo. <laughs> well, I, I just, I don't know how to say this last one shocked me. All right. And I'd just like to put it out there that this would be a big nope from me. Okay. And let's, let's just get on to number 11, is crocodile dung. Now, this is an ancient medicine. Ancient Egyptians were really creative with the methods they used to prevent unwanted pregnancies. One of their most notoriously inventive methods was inserting crocodile dung into one's vajayjay. And nope, that's not happening. <laughs> While it's unclear whether this method actually worked, it is obvious how unhygienic and dangerous it actually was. <laughs> so if you're looking for an alternative contraception out there, guys, and you don't mind using a bit of cow dung, go for it. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right, Kaz. <laughs> I don't know, Kynan. I have no idea. <laughs> Oh, I've got no idea how we survived so long, actually, to be honest with you. <laughs> the Yungon penis or pollution ring was an attempt to prevent nighttime emissions, a steel locking device that was... Well, you know, I could have done a whole video on actual devices and operations studies, so I think I will do that next time. This one, I just tried to stick to more medicines and you know, contraception, as we saw with the crocodile dung. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lambo, minge. That's all I'm going to say, minge. That's not... <laughs> How awful. Like, I mean, does crocodile dung smell? Like, what is it? Maybe it's non-offensive. It would smell like fish, wouldn't it? Because don't they eat? What do they eat? What do crocodiles eat in the Nile? It would smell like whatever they eat. Surely they're scat wood. So I don't know. Then we're getting into really dangerous territory with that. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's have a Captain Cook at the news. Talking about crazy scientists, here's one. Scientists have revived some tiny animals that were frozen for 24,000 years in Arctic permafrost. The tiny multicellular microbes came back to life and produced offspring after 24,000 years. 24,000 years ago, a group of microscopic animals called deloid rotifers became frozen in a layer of Siberian permafrost and entered a state of suspended animation. Now, in a microbial version of Encino Man, scientists have discovered that the ancient rotifers could not only be revived after their uh, eon-spanning nap, they could also successfully produce offspring. The mind-boggling discovery constitutes the longest reported case of rotifer survival in a frozen state and is of great interest to not only evolutionary biology, but also practical purposes of um, cryobiology and biotechnology. According to a published study, um, which was in Current Biology. I mean, I just think about it and I think, well, what could possibly go wrong? You know, sometimes we, maybe I've seen too many movies. Yeah, exactly. Maybe I've just seen way too many movies. Maybe I have. Maybe I just think, keep thinking a lot could go wrong, actually. A lot. <laughs> 
Okay, my three picks for people, historic people that I'd like to spend an evening with tonight is Joseph Lister, the father of asepsis, which every modern day tattoo artist should be thankful for because we have to follow like surgical asepsis and it's probably saved a lot of lives. Edward Jenner, the father of immunology and Alexander Fleming, the father of antibiotics. They would be who I would want to <laughs> spend that time with. Yeah, Egyptians, huh? Ancient Egyptians, like nutters, like amazing nutters, but that's a bit nutty, isn't it? Come on now. I, I think I see the premise. It was like just, good morning, Zach. I think it was just like a physical barrier, but really, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> who was the first to do it? Who was the first to do it? That's what I want to know. Okay, so I'm going to get out of here now because I'm going to go have a cup of tea, feed my chooks and have a rest. I will be back again. <laughs> Stop it, Lambo. And I will be back again tomorrow. Thank you so much for all the beautiful messages you sent me yesterday. I very much appreciated it. I'm back on track. That just happens sometimes. As always, it's been great to spend Smoko with you. Please leave a thumbs up below the screen. Subscribe if you haven't already so that I can make it to 500 before my birthday. And then you will also be notified. So don't forget to ding my little bell so that you get the notifications. Thank you so much for watching. Say good day in the comments. Suggest a subject for a future video. And I hope that you will join me tomorrow morning at 9.30 at the same time. Have a fantastic day. Be good, everyone. Love and kisses. Bye. See you later.